Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, some practical uh, opportunities in the energy market for blockchain. Um, I'm going to make certain assumptions about blockchain. Um, I'm not going to go into anything that's really very technical on the blockchain side, but, but please stop me if I make some assumptions about what blockchain can do or how it operates that, that are not obvious or that you're not familiar with. So, so feel free to, uh, to interrupt. Um, what I'd like to talk about, first of all, is how, we, uh, how we've been looking at the energy market and where we think the opportunities are for blockchain in the energy market and what values it can bring. Um, the, the, all of the attention so far has been on the financial services market, where effectively the financial services market is this very huge, highly regulated, uh, highly competitive market that operates on a shared infrastructure, things like security repositories, trading platforms, and so forth. And of course, the energy industry is a huge, highly regulated market that also operates over a shared infrastructure. And in the case of the energy market, the shared infrastructure revolves around things like asset registration, where are the renewables located, where are the plants, where are the supply points or the meters, um, and how are they uh, contracted currently, and how might that change? So, so any way of registering those we think is one of the first big areas, and I'll put that up at the top there, asset registration. The second area, which we believe is an important area of shared infrastructure, is transactions or trading, where parties are coming together to either buy power, in the case, a very common case, um, or increasingly in other areas where there are things which we would call missing markets. So areas where value is currently being lost because transactions are not happening or are not happening efficiently. And I'd like to talk a little bit about where we think some of those opportunities are and specifically some of the things that we're doing about that. Um, the final area is data. Um, and, and data hasn't received an awful lot of attention so far. Um, but data is something that is required both for anything to do with asset registration but also to do with the, uh, the transactions and trading. And of course, they throw off data. And who owns that data, where it's sitting, who has access to it, who controls access to it, is becoming and will become increasingly important. Now, all of these things do not sit in isolation. We think that these things are connected. Um, and that's where we see some of the real value coming that blockchain can bring. And I'll try and talk about that as we go through the different areas. So what I'd like to move on to is discussing the first of these areas which will be asset registration, and talk about a specific use case and what the value there potentially is going to be. Uh, the regulator um, in the UK is Ofgem. Um, and there is a big desire by the regulator to ensure that there is plenty of competition in the supply of gas and electricity in the UK. And in order to do this, they would like to see much faster switching between suppliers. Right now, the, uh, the infrastructure that supports the switching of suppliers, uh, it takes around about 20 days. It's pre-internet technology that is currently being used. And that's one of the reasons why it takes 20 days to record the change of supplier event between a, lose, between a losing supplier to a gaining supplier. Um, now, one of the things that they want to see happen to avoid this or to improve on this is the creation of a central registration service. Right now, the data is held in 14 different databases. It's coordinated through effectively flat files being transferred on FTP servers. It's all very basic and very straightforward. Um, so what a central registration service would do is centralize all of that and make it happen in effect the next day. So that's the plan. Now, it's not just supply points or meters that we're talking about here. Because if you have an asset registration uh, platform, um, you can extend that uh, and extend it to deal with all sorts of other things, such as renewable generation. Right now, we don't really have a good way of recording where all of those are. In fact, in the first two or three years of the rollout, 
of PV, uh, photovoltaic, in the UK. Nobody had been kept a record of where this was located. So this information isn't, isn't currently out there, and it needs to be, and it needs to be associated with things like supply points. Um, and then if you start looking at perhaps domestic uh, flexibility or demand-side response transactions, again, that's going to require a, um, a central register to know where that's available and where that's coming from. So these are the reasons why um, a registration uh, or asset registration is very important and why it actually goes far beyond simply connecting meters and suppliers. So this is what we're aiming to do uh, and why we're trying to do it, so the outcomes. So first of all, we think this is going to be cheaper. Um, and the reason we make this assertion is because blockchains allow us to remove the central intermediary from the process. Now, with a central intermediary, they always have interests that are 180 degrees opposite to the users. They're trying to extract as much money as they can for providing a service. The users, obviously, want to pay as little as possible for that service. By removing that central intermediary with those particular incentives, you solve two problems. First of all, you make it cheaper, but secondly, you solve the regulator's problem because what you've handed on a plate to the central intermediary is a monopoly, and in order to, to uh, control a monopoly, you have to regulate it with things like how much, what's its return on capital and so forth. So you've solved that problem if you've removed the central intermediary. We, uh, we have a fully uh, functioning version of a central registration working. It's not the actual central registration. We hope to be able to be able to do that at some point. Um, but that's not actually going out for tender for another year or so. Um, but we have actually simulated the entire UK um, supply points, meters, and all of the suppliers uh, on a blockchain uh, and proved that it's perfectly feasible to, to run this on a blockchain. I'll be happy to talk about that if people are interested uh, separately. One of the other things that a blockchain provides in this case is a level playing field. Um, with a central solution, <clears throat> typically the largest payers will be paying the largest amounts of money. Um, so it's kind of natural, whoever the central participant or the central operator on, on a, before blockchains came along, to listen more carefully to what the biggest customers were going to say if they want to change in the API or the interface to these platforms. If you wanted to extend the platform to include some other things, well, you know, it's, you're going to listen to whoever's paying you the most money. Now, on a blockchain, you have control yourself. So you might be a smaller participant, but you have your smart contract on there, and your smart contract, only you can sign it, and only you can then change that. So if you want to extend the functionality of your smart contract, for example, to include information about whether or not that particular meter has somebody who's in a house who's got a uh, dialysis machine or something like that, or is a, a vulnerable customer, and you want to offer an additional service, you can do that. You don't have to go and ask people's permission and get them to change the central platform. You can do that yourself. So that's what we mean when we say level, level playing field. Uh, easier to regulate. I, I mentioned the regulation already, so I won't go over that. Um, it also becomes much more extensible. Um, and it's extensible by the individual participants on the platform by adding additional services. Now, you might pay a little bit, a little bit extra, if you've got additional resources being consumed on the blockchain, but presumably you're doing that because you've got a better business model, and that's improving your business model. So it provides a mechanism for innovating. Okay, so those, those are the key outcomes that we see coming out of blockchain, and particularly in its application to um, a central registration service. So why is this important? Um, well, I think over the next uh, 10 or 15 years, we're going to see an explosion of IoT devices being installed in people's homes. And with the, uh, at least in the UK, I, I can't say what's happening here, but you're losing phone lines going into people's houses. Everyone's mo using mobile phones these days. So the only fixed endpoints 
in the country are coming down to energy, gas and electricity, and water. And the water industry, at least in the UK, is well behind the energy industry. Uh, so your fixed supply points, your know your customer, your knowledge of where everything is situated and located, um, revolves around, potentially, around all of those energy suppliers who have client relationships with every single one of those endpoints. A credit relationship, perhaps, maybe it's a pay-as-you-go meet or whatever, but they know, they know where it's located, and they know what it is, and they potentially are in a contractual arrangement with buying and selling uh, gas and electricity. And that's incredibly powerful, because on the one hand, you've got all of these devices that are going to be plugged in on the other side of those supply points, generating large amounts of data, sending transactions, buy me some washing powder, get me some more printer ink, whatever it is. We can't even guess what it's going to be. Um, and really, the only people who know where all of these things are are the energy suppliers. And that's a huge opportunity. So if you can tie that asset registration to the, the customer, which you can with asset registration, and then layer on top of it certain additional services relating potentially to data or transactions, then you have a whole new business model and the ability to extend a business model to energy suppliers. Um, I'll give you one good example of this from, from the UK, which um, uh, I, don't, I don't know the situation here, but in the UK, if you want to open a bank account, you've got to turn up with your utility bill um, and your passport and various other bits and pieces. Or if you want to work with a lawyer or a, an accountant and so forth, you require all of this. Um, and right now, if I'm a utility company, I don't get paid for that. My bills are taken down to the bank to prove who I am, but there's no, I don't get anything out of that. Um, it would be quite feasible to uh, layer on top of an asset registration platform a um, PKI, a public key infrastructure, which provides effectively the ability for supply points to create their own public keys which in turn can be used to sign and verify who they are and potentially then verify the transactions that they're sending in through their IoT devices or through their data. Um, and there's, a, there's, a, there's an example of a service and something that people could be charged for and something that has real value. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> the other thing I want to stress in relation to uh, blockchains is um, it's not a single company opportunity. Um, you, you know, building a blockchain inside a single company is like building a railway line with only one station. It makes no sense at all. It only has real value when you've got cooperation and potentially the more the merrier in cooperating. So everything that we're doing uh, relates to trying to bring together consortium of energy suppliers uh, and distributors and so forth to be able to come together around blockchain uh, and provide a service in that way. Uh, so that's what we're doing. And the example I've just given of an asset registration service is one that we currently have 20 different suppliers cooperating with us um, and several of the big system integrators uh, and a couple of the big professional service providers in building this, in building this platform. Okay. So I'd like to move on to uh, transactions and trading and give you another example of where we think uh, blockchain is going to be, uh, be very valuable. Um, I, I don't know ex what the sort of level of um, uh, understanding is of various aspects of the, uh, the energy market. I'm going to talk a little bit about something called demand-side response. Is that something that people are generally familiar with, DSR? People know that, okay. So demand-side response, very, very briefly, for those of you who don't know, is, is um, instead of turning up generation when there's a big demand, um, the system operator sends a signal to large consumers to turn down and pays them for that. That, in effect, is demand-side response. It's just don't turn on another power plant, turn down what's currently being used. Now, that is a, currently a bilateral market in the UK. Um, and so what I want to do is talk a little bit 
about why that's very suitable for blockchain and what the opportunities for that are. Uh, this slide really just covers um, the system, the energy system, and I think this is a fairly common, uh, although the examples in here are from the UK, uh, this is something which is, is, is common right across the world uh, about how the energy market is changing, how the energy system is changing. So um, a, a number of you will be familiar with this, but maybe what I could just say is right now, the energy market is a really fascinating place to be. We've got a, uh, the rollout of renewables is proceeding much faster than anyone anticipated. Uh, even five or ten years ago. Um, that's making a huge difference to the way in which system operators balance the grid and then their ability and the tools they have at their disposal are rapidly improving with digitalization. So basically everything's changing, everything's up for grabs, it's a very exciting place to be and there's a lot going on. That's the summary of that slide. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, demand side response as a lead into what we're doing on this particular platform. Uh, and this is, uh, this is something called the duck curve. And the example here is from, actually, I think from California. Um, and what, what that graph is showing um, is, I don't know if I've got a little laser on this thing. Maybe, oh. So this is um, the, the, what was the current, this level here. And then as we go down, this is the current and projected over time. In other words, the the, the back of this duck is getting deeper and deeper. And what this is showing on the left-hand side is the net uh, requirement after renewables have taken into account. So this is how much generation is required after all of the renewable generation has been taken into account. So what you're seeing here, and this is the time, so in the middle of the afternoon, as more solar panels get installed, the requirement, the, the pull on what's called the base, uh, the base load generation from traditional generators is getting less and less and less. So, and it peaks, and then obviously the sun goes down, and then we get late afternoon and early evening when there is no more sun, and everyone comes home, puts the kettle on, and so forth, and there's a huge surge in demand at that point in time. Now, this is getting more and more, um, uh, uh, getting deeper and deeper and getting more and more uh, important. Uh, and this is having a huge effect on how, this, how the grid is operated. So what is required um, or what needs to happen, particularly if you think that that's going to be much higher with electric vehicles, is you're going to need potentially a lot more generation. Now, the alternative to doing, and, and, and what I should have said, sorry, is that this big, deep um, decrease in the requirement from the base generation that's going on is making it much less economic to build those big power stations because they're not going to work all the time. They're only going to work in the evening. So something that's designed to work 24 hours a day can't, can't meet its uh, cost. So this is causing a, a huge problem. So what's the answer to this? And one of the answers is to find a way in which you... Uh, mitigate uh, or drive down the demand. Um, and that's why we come to requiring a marketplace for flexibility or demand-side response. Um, and so what do we want to do? <clears throat> well, we're trying to encourage more people to engage in responding to signals that say turn down. And there are many people that can. So Big supermarkets, you know, it doesn't matter if your freezers are running at minus 20 or minus 15, they're still freezing. So can you turn it down at that point when the grid needs you to turn it down? Um, big uh, sort of asphalt heaters and things like this. Uh, huge fans that are used in big car parks to circulate, uh, to circulate air. All of these things are capable of responding to um, signals to have them turned down. The problem, however, is that all of those signals are coming from one party and are ending up at one other party. It's a bilateral market. But actually, let's go put it on the next side, actually there are several parties involved who potentially could benefit from this. So there is a question. If I have, and here's an example of a DSR action here, and let's say this is, I don't know, 100 pounds uh, per megawatt, 
Um, that's what this party wants. So this is an end user who wants to be paid to turn down. The system operator can't quite manage that. They can maybe pay 80 pounds. The distributor can maybe pay 30 pounds. Why? Because they've got some stressed assets. They've installed some electric vehicles. You know, these things are, are, um, are causing it expensive problems. So if I can get it to turn down, that suits me because I can prolong the life of my asset, let's say. And then potentially you have a supplier who's not bought quite enough energy for that period and would be very happy if you turned it down. Now, right now, this trade doesn't happen. This, this whole thing doesn't happen because this is the only guy in the market. Although these two people are playing somewhat separately. But these trades aren't happening. So if you can bring that together, you have a market. You have a market, and not only that, you have a transparent market in which multiple parties can collaborate. Everyone is a winner. These people pay less than they would otherwise. This guy gets a deal that he wouldn't otherwise have got. And the consequence of that is you have more people attracted into the market. OK. so. That's a collaborative trade. The collaborative trade itself, uh, the way in which we do this, is to disaggregate the separate components. And we allow each of those components to be priced uh, separately and um, in secret on a blockchain, revealing the information only when all parties have collaborated, uh, excuse me, have put their prices in, which then allows us to create a, um, a trade. And it's a creating a trade that's totally um, uh, uh, audited or auditable in terms of who has done what and when they've done it. So everyone can have complete confidence that the trade was brought together in uh, a fair and honest way. And the transaction happened, and the cost reallocation happened in a fair and transparent and honest way. So that's what a blockchain platform can give us. Uh, I'll briefly run through these. So what does this give us? What, what's the real benefit of this? Well, if you've got something where more trades are happening, it tends to snowball. More transactions produce more interest, produce, you know, a greater involvement and engagement, you get more of a turnover, and more people are coming together to transact. So that's in everyone's interest in this market. It's more transparent, and it importantly is at a much lower cost. Okay. I think I've, I've covered that, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave those and just move on to the last piece, which is energy data. Uh, and I'll cover that relatively quickly. So, um, Actually, I'm sorry, before I move on to that, I'll just give you one brief uh, message on the previous um, flexibility trading platform. So we currently have uh, 15 different parties, some major names involved, in fact, mostly major names, from including the system operator in the UK as the national grid, uh, along with parties like Siemens um, and a variety of other parties that we haven't announced yet, but we'll be doing shortly, who are getting around a table um, to define the specific products that we're, we're producing for this uh, and to um, uh, put some of their transactions and liquidity into this platform. So this is, this is starting to happen now, and we have a platform that actually accomplishes this. Okay, so quickly moving on to, to data. Um, I won't cover this in any great detail, but I just make the point that um, the problem with data is that individual pieces of data are only valuable when you can see them in context. So there's a bit of an asymmetry in this problem. Um, you have to be able to see the total context in order to see where your piece of data fits. The problem is, is that parties aren't really willing to share that data if they don't have to. And the reason they're not prepared to, to share the data is very simple. It's because they're not paid for it. There's no incentive for them to do it. So people are sitting on silos of data which if they were to share and be rewarded for sharing, they would find um, where their data sits and extract value from that. And importantly, people can come into the market and offer additional services. So one of the dirty little secrets of the machine learning industry 
is actually not that, that Google and DeepMind, I'm sure they've got some very clever people there, but it's not that they're geniuses and nobody else is. It's that they're sitting on vast amounts of data that other people don't have access to. So you can have the best algorithms in the world in machine learning, but unless you have the millions of data points to train it, you won't do as well as somebody with an average algorithm and all of those millions of data points. And that's an important thing to remember when it comes to ensuring that there's competition to provide the kind of services that can work off this data. Okay, so the final, final thing I'll wrap up on then is just talking about a data access platform, which again removes the intermediary, the party that is trying to extract all of the value out of the data, the Facebook of the energy business, the Google of the energy business, and ensure that there is no central party that can uh, monopolize ownership and therefore uh, extract the majority of the value. Um, so that's, that's the final piece. And again, I can talk in that in a little bit more detail if anyone's interested. I think that's it. Thank you.